All righty, all righty. We're continuing our studies in the uh, book, The Acts of the Apostles, and uh, last week we were looking at chapter 11, and uh, chapter 11 has uh, two parts to it, as I have up on the board here. Uh, the first part we looked at last week, which verses 1 through 18, where Peter uh, rehearsed and defended his ministry to Cornelius. We saw how the Lord wanted to impress upon us the importance of the miracle of, the, of converting a sinner like Cornelius to salvation. And this, again, is the greatest miracle that God does. Uh, the greatest miracle that God does right now on planet Earth is to take a sinner and to turn him into a saint, to save that person. That's the greatest miracle. I know there are people running around looking for miracles of healings and looking for miracles of speaking in tongues. And even if God were doing those things, which He's not, uh, they're small potatoes compared to the miracle of converting a sinner to salvation. And God made that plain and clear as we read through chapter 10. And we saw God uh, taking a look at Peter's miracles of uh, healing a sick man and even raising a dead and making that pale in comparison to the salvation of Cornelius. That's the great work. And the 11th chapter, the beginning of it, Peter has to defend that ministry. Sometimes I think we have to defend that ministry today. Because there are so many people out there that are wanting the church to do things other than convert sinners to saints through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, the purpose of the church after its uh, number one priority, which is to worship the Father in spirit and truth, but the secondary purpose is to go out and to take this gospel and, and to use that the miracle working power of Jesus Christ to take people who are lost and undone without God and His Son, people that are still sinners on the, uh, the way uh, that may seem right to them, but it's a way that leads to death and hell, to take those people and turn them from the errors of their way and to bring them to Jesus Christ. And it's a funny thing that, that the few churches that are doing that have to defend themselves to the other counterfeit churches, the clown churches that have all kinds of goofy things going on in there with people singing and jumping and, and barking like dogs and, and doing fake miracles and people running the, uh, the aisles and having them bopped in the head or someone breathing on them. The, the real ministry that Peter had to defend was the ministry of going out to lost people and saying, look, this is what Jesus wants us to do. This is the Great Commission. You shall be witnesses unto me. And so Peter had to defend that. So it's not unlike what goes on today. But now, when we come to the second half of this particular chapter, God's going to do something very interesting from an historical standpoint that we'll spend some time looking at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can open in Acts chapter 11. And there are usually Bibles in the pews for people that didn't bring a Bible. So they, they get in the pew. They can open one of those pew Bibles in Acts chapter 11. And we'll begin our reading in verse 19, and we'll see what happens. Uh, verse 19, uh, we'll read 19 through 21. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as uh, Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them, which were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which uh, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Now, last week someone asked me a question about this verse, and we didn't get an opportunity to cover it last week because we were emphasizing the fact that what God is doing is He's taking this precious gospel of His and He's turning it not just to the Jew only, but turning it to the Greek also. And turning it to Gentiles. And that's why Peter and the men were so surprised that God took something that they thought was uncommon or unclean and cleansed it by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so much so that he performed a miracle for the unbelieving Jews, if you will. will that's what they kind of were. Were kind of unbelieving that God would reach out to Gentiles and performed a miracle to convince those unbelieving Jews because the Jews require a sign. Now, what had happened simultaneously while this work was going on in, in Caesarea Philippi was, verse 19, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Now, this takes you back to Acts chapter 8. Just so you can understand historically what's happening. And in Acts chapter 8, after the stoning of Stephen, verse 1, Saul was consenting unto his, Stephen's, death. 
And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they, which, they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, what had happened is about a year after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, about a year later, maybe a year, maybe 18 months, I'm not entirely certain, there began great persecution in Jerusalem. The church initially was birthed in Jerusalem because God gave the oracles of God unto the Jews. And he's committing his work to the Jews and he brought his son as a Jew and he's preaching to the Jews. The gospel is to the Jew first. So the Jews in Jerusalem are turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is angering the local religious authorities, which are clinging to the Old Testament sacrifices of bull and goats and the temple. All right. So, so they're getting angry and they're persecuting now the church, the believers in Jesus Christ. And what happens is many of these believers scatter and go throughout all regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, actually, the Lord is, I believe, behind this because what might have happened is they might have been too comfortable settling in to Jerusalem. And Jesus said, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria. And so God kind of let the heat get turned up. He allowed persecution and tribulation to come in their life so that they would get out of their comfort zone, if you will, and get moving and get the gospel going. And so these Jewish men, go back to Acts chapter 2, just to remind you. Go back to Acts chapter 2. On the day when Pentecost came, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. There were Jews that lived in other nations, but they came for the Feast of Pentecost to Jerusalem. They came from all over. Verse 9, they came from Parthia and Mede and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. And by the way, some of the names you'll see right here are mentioned in the 11th chapter. Um, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Parts of Libya, watch, Cyrene, you're going to see that in Acts in the 11th chapter. Rome, Jews and some proselytes. 11, Cretes, you'll see that again in, in Acts chapter 11. And Arabians, these are Jewish men coming out of these nations, coming to Jerusalem for the feast. And they're hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them, their hearts are turning to Jesus Christ and now receiving the revelation of the New Testament, understanding that once for all... The blood shed by Jesus Christ would cleanse from sin. No longer do they need to go to bulls and goats and go back to a temple year in and year out for sacrifice. Now they can receive the remission of sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and enter into a personal relationship with God. These are Jews doing this. Now in the 8th chapter, these Jews get scattered. And so in the 11th chapter... They, verse 19, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Why? That's what happened in the second chapter. The preaching was to Jews. Ye men of Judea, ye Jews, hear me, Peter said. So they're doing what they saw. They're following the pattern that they saw in the second chapter. Verse 20, And some of them which were men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Again, we saw those names. Let me put up a map for you. On the map here, you can see... Let me get a pencil to point. All right. Here's the large Mediterranean Sea. And over in this region, the streak of blue would be the Jordan River. And of course, the nation Israel is right next to the Jordan River. Jerusalem is down in this region here. They're scattered abroad. They're heading up in this direction. They're going in the northerly direction. It says, where do they go? As far as Phenis. Phenis is Phoenicia, right here. Had the cities of Tyre and Sidon in them. Um, As far as Cyprus. There's the Isle of Cyprus. Some of them got on a boat and head in that direction. As far as Antioch, verse 19. This little dot 
up here is Antioch. It's the capital city, the, je the jewel of the east, the queen of the east in the region of Syria. And so they're going in this direction. These are Jewish men going in that direction. And what are they doing? Verse 19, they're preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Why? That's what they saw Peter do in the second chapter. They thought that's what they were supposed to do. And that is a good thing to do. But the gospel is not only to the Jew, it's also to the Greek. And God now in time, and this is about, this period here would be about uh, seven to ten years after the scattering. So this is a, a while and God's now beginning to turn and send this gospel to the Gentiles. What happens is, verse 20, some of them, which were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So initially they're going out and preaching to Jews only, and now a number of them begin preaching to non-Jews, to the Grecians. What hap what's happening is God, by His Spirit, simultaneously is working in the hearts of these people confirming in the mouths of a second witness and a third witness that this is a work that he's going to establish that he had done with Peter. They didn't know Peter had done this in Caesarea Philippi, but God's Spirit is beginning to move and to stir and to work to branch this gospel out to the whole world. And so God's working here. So that, that answers that question from last week. It's, it's the Spirit of God at work. How do I know? Verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. And a, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And so now what's happening is God in the New Testament is doing a new work. And no longer has His Word committed only to the Jews. But His Word is opening up to the whole world. Opening up to everyone. Now, now I'm thankful for that. Because I wasn't born a Jew. And I'm thankful that God, in His mercy, uh, decreed that that gospel would come to me also. And I hope you're thankful about that too. And I don't know if there are any Jews in this audience today. I, I, looking around, I don't, I don't think I see any Jews here. Well, that gospel's come to you. And that was the movement of the hand and the Spirit of God and the Word of God to bring this forth. So, this is, this is beginning to happen now. The Gentiles, the Grecians, are getting the Word. Um, one of the ways we know that is uh, verse 18. When they heard these uh, things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying that God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Gentiles, Grecians, Greeks, kind of a, a similar equivalent word that God will use. And that's why you'll see verses like uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek, the Grecians, the Gentiles, the non-Jews. At that time, the, uh, the major uh, language of the educated world was Greek at that particular time. So you'll, you'll see those terms used equivalently in many places. All right, so the hand of the Lord is with them. The word is going out. People are turning in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, it happens today. Many Greeks, if you will, many Gentiles, when they hear the word of the Lord, turn to Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, travel all the way up north there to Syria and that queen city, and uh, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. As he came up there to Antioch, Antioch, again, I, I pointed out to you in the northern part of Syria there, was established in about 300 B.C., by the uh, general Seleucus Nicator after the breakup of uh, Alexander. When Alexander the Great died, his, uh, his rule was divided into four sections by his four generals. And the, the general uh, Seleucus took the region of Syria and ruled that. He made this uh, city Antioch into the capital city of the Syrian dynasty. He named it after his father who was named Antioch. And I can't find the name of that word. If anybody can, let me know. Uh, I imagine there's something in there, but I, I can't find it. Uh, anyways, the, he named it uh, Antioch. The city grew. It, it grew immensely. And it's estimated that at one point it had a population of 800,000 people. 
that's pretty significant for a city back in, in old times like that. I mean, nowadays we do it. We have the sewers underground and the electricity, but that was a lot back then to have a city of that size. In 64 B.C., uh, Pompey of the Roman army came in and conquered Syria and then made Antioch a Roman province, but it was still a great city, and it was the queen, the jewel of the east, and a lot of the Romans would go and spend their time there. And so there were a lot of Gentile, Greek-speaking people in that region. So, so when, when Barnabas comes and he sees now, hey, we're not just reaching out to the Jewish population in Antioch, the small population of Jewish people that may be a few tens of thousands, we're reaching out to this large city of hundreds of thousands with the gospel. He was glad when he saw this. He saw that the grace of God was at work, the grace of God which bringeth salvation unto men. How are we saved? By grace are you saved. Not of works. By grace, through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. And, and Barnabas is seeing this at, at, happening right now as the hand of God and the Spirit of God is working. And these Gentiles, these Greeks, aren't doing any works. They're just hearing the Word of God and they're turning to the Lord Jesus Christ in a relationship with God. And he was glad. And then he exhorted them. He said, what you need to do is to cleave unto the Lord. In other words, don't just get saved and go back to the way you used to live. You need to get saved and you need to cleave unto the Lord. And the way you're going to do this is with purpose of heart. See, just go back to Daniel chapter 1. See, the sad thing that happens nowadays is I see people getting saved. And, and, and you wonder, well, are they really saved? Well, I'll tell you this. Jesus said that it takes faith as a grain of a mustard seed. It doesn't take a lot of faith, just a little bit of faith. A little bit of faith placed in the right object, placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll deposit that small amount of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll save you. That's all it takes. A little bit of faith. And He said, of such is the kingdom of God, little children will come. And little children, hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ, will, will give their heart to Jesus. i heard testimony after testimony after testimony of four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven, eight-year-olds turning to Jesus Christ and placing their faith in Jesus. Of course, I also then hear the subsequent testimony of those very same children going out and living a life not cleaving to the Lord and falling back into their old ways, falling into a pattern of sin. And then you hear about this and then people come and go, well, were they really saved? Maybe they weren't really saved. Well, are we going to believe their works? Or are we going to believe the Word of God? And the Word of God said that if a little child comes with faith as a grain of mustard seed and places it in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's His saving work. It wasn't theirs. But sadly, like the, the uh, Jesus example and parable of the one seed that fell into the ground, but as it was coming up, it was choked by the thorns around it, choked by the thorny life of this world of woe that we live in. It never got to bring forth fruit. Yeah, but the roots were in the ground, Jesus said. It had roots. And the root of righteous is the tree of life. And Jesus is the root. The stem of Jesse, he's the root. He's the one. Yeah, they have eternal life, but they, they don't have much of a testimonial life. And, and, and Barnabas says, look it, you've just gotten saved. You need to cleave to the Lord. But the way you're going to do it is like Daniel did. Here was a young boy in Daniel uh, an example in the book of Daniel, and he was carried away captive into a foreign land. Verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And, and Barnabas said to them, Look, it, you have to purpose in your heart that you're going to cleave to the Lord. This is not going to happen accidentally. This is not going to happen willy-nilly. There, there has to be somewhere inside of you there, is, there are reins in your heart and they're the things that guide you and direct you in this life. And you all have them and you all use them. How do I know? Well, I used them. I was a lost man. I had reins in my heart. And those reins said, make a lot of money. And, and, I, and I followed those reins. Those reins said, you can make a lot of money by being a doctor. And I said, then I'll be a doctor. I'm not stupid. I mean, it's a good payoff. And I took those reins in my heart and I said, medical school. And nothing was going to stop me. And I did it. And I became a doctor. And you know what? I made lots of money. 
I was still unhappy. And thankfully, someone brought me the gospel because I saw that I couldn't have riches in my heart by material riches. The only riches that I could truly treasure was Jesus Christ. But I had reins and I steered them. And you have reins and you steer your life too. And Barnabas says, you better watch it. You better purpose in your heart. You better take those reins and you better steer them toward cleaving to the Lord. You better purpose in your heart to do that. Because if you don't and you think you're just going to travel without guiding those reins of yours, you'll just go right back on alternate paths even as a saved man or a saved woman. And I've seen it time and time again. You need to purpose in your heart. And Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. I'm not going to go the world's way. I'm not going to go the way of all flesh anymore. I'm going to purpose in my heart to cleave unto the Lord. I'll turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 20. Barnabas exhorted them. You need to purpose in your heart. This is not going to happen accidentally. Jesus is good. Jesus has saved your soul. And Jesus will keep your soul. But what are you going to do with your life? And how are you going to live the life of the flesh that you now have for the next number of decades you have on planet Earth? You better purpose in your heart to cleave to the Lord. Because Jesus is not a taskmaster that's going to make you obey Him. You're going to do it by purposing in your heart to stay close to Him and to read His Word. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, uh, verse 18. Every purpose is established by counsel. You want a purpose in your heart, you need good counsel. And you'll find it hard to do it on your own. Which is one of the reasons we're going to see the work in the Acts of the Apostles as God begins to build His church. He's going to build an assembly. We'll see it in this very chapter where people will assemble together and the counsel of God will be preached and the counsel of God will be taught with understanding so people can take that counsel and they can establish their purposes. Otherwise, if you try and purpose on your own, if you think that you can get saved and live the Christian life on your own, you are mistaken because Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus lights a candle. The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And when He lights that candle with His Spirit and deep touches deep and the flame of God's eternal life hits your spirit, He says, then He taketh a candle and putteth it on a candlestick. He doesn't leave it alone in a room or put it under a bushel. He puts it on a candlestick. And the candlesticks, Revelation chapter 1, are the churches. And he says, You're gonna, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you in a place where you can be established. And then you, every purpose that you have will be established by counsel. And I'll put you in the presence of counselors that have begun to walk the walk and talk the talk and will give you the Scriptures line upon line, precept upon precept. Barnabas says, you you guys need to purpose in your heart to cleave to the Lord. And you're going to need to do it with the others around you. You will not be able to walk this walk alone. Only Jesus could walk that walk alone. You cannot. You must now follow Jesus and be one of His disciples. Go back to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Every purpose is established by counsel. Proverbs 15, verse 22. And without counsel, purposes are disappointed. If you just purpose in your heart to follow the Lord and think you can do it alone and walk that road alone, there is no such a road that God has. He has the road that was plowed by Jesus Christ and He says, take my yoke upon you. Get in the yoke and learn of me. And follow me and walk with me and walk with my disciples on this path that I've cleared for you. And if if you don't have counsel, the purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. And the counselors will have a dual reference here. It will not only be the, the gifts of the evangelists and the pastors and teachers that God has given to you, but turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And look at verse 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. 
Not only do you just have the, the teachers around you, but you have the very written Word of God, Psalm 118, about the Word of God. The testimonies and the law and the commandments of God Almighty that you have, that I see you have in your lap right now and you're reading through it. And you have those to be your counselors. And you must purpose in your heart like Daniel. I don't want the king's meat and I don't want the king's drink. I want God's manna and his meat of the word and his drink of the living waters and his Holy Spirit. And I want the assembly of God's people. And he says, you need to purpose in your heart to cleave unto the Lord because you will not be able to do it alone. You will not be able to do it alone. Go back to Acts chapter 11. It it's, it's, troubles me. It troubles me today to see Christians. And I was talking to a Christian not too long ago. And, uh, and I also heard one giving the same testimony on television. And, and I hope and trust he's a Christian. I pray that he is. And the testimony was, I don't like to go to church on Sundays. I like to get alone with God out here. Now, this one place he owned like a, a couple of hundred acres. And he'd go out there and he would take his Sundays out in, in nature with God. And I had another Christian talking about how he would spend his time with God on the golf course. And he was going alone with God on his Sundays. That was just a way just to get away from him. Because after all, there's a lot of hypocrisy in the church. All right. Well, there's just as much hypocrisy on the golf course as there is in the church. Matter of fact, there's a worse kind of hypocrisy on the golf course. And there may be some hypocrites in the church. And that there are people who are trying to profess a certain thing and they're not able to live up to it. And that's understandable. But it's here in the church where the councils are established and the purposes are established and we're able to encourage one another where God says, assemble together and cleave unto me. Where you can begin to get that growth. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Otherwise, you're not going to grow out there. And, And those people I listen to, they don't have much of a testimony because they haven't purposed in their heart to cleave unto the Lord. And to get the good counsel that they need. And to spend time in His Word. But Barnabas exhorted them all that would purpose of heart they cleave unto the Lord. Going back to Acts chapter 11, verse 24. For for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added to the Lord. Now verse 24 is written in a particular way that we discussed one Thursday night here. It's written a lot like Acts chapter 13, verse 48, where there is a series of clauses and phrases in the verse, for he was a good man, comma, and full of the Holy Ghost, and understood, and full of faith. So you have these three phrases put inside that verse. But we understand from searching the Scriptures that that's not the order chronologically. God is not under obligation to put every verse in chronological order. We understand that the first thing that Barnabas became full of was faith. When he heard the word of the Lord, he turned in faith to the word that was preached. And by by filling himself with faith and trusting in what God said, God imparted the Holy Ghost to him. And, And the fullness of faith and the fullness of Holy Ghost tend to go together. And if you're faithless, you won't be full of the Holy Ghost. But if you will will continue to exercise your faith and place your faith and your trust in what God has said and in the Word of God, then the Spirit of God will minister to the Word of God. He will guide you into the Word of truth. The Spirit of truth will do that. And then you will have the fullness of the faith of the Word of truth and the fullness of the Spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. And then you can be a good man. Well, there's none good. That's true in and of yourself, in your natural man. But if you're full of faith and you're full of the Holy Ghost, then that puts you in the position that Paul is in in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, which is a verse that we often quote. And I'll read it to you. Galatians chapter 2. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When you're full of faith, your faith is in Jesus Christ. You're full of the Holy Ghost who testifies of the Son of God and conforms you to His image. And then you become a good man because it's not you doing it, it's Christ living in you. And the life 
which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Barnabas followed in those footsteps. Barnabas was not preaching anything that he himself had not obeyed. Barnabas himself assembled with the other men that had faith in Jesus Christ. Barnabas prayed with those men. Barnabas opened the word with those men. And then Barnabas, being full of faith, had the Holy Ghost attend and allowed him to be a good man. Wouldn't you like to be a good man? Isn't that a good testimony to have? You know, you want a good name is better than great riches. One of the ways you get a good name is by being a good man. And the only way you can be a good man is by being full of faith in the Holy Ghost. That's the only way in God's sight that you can be a good man. Because then His Son is living in you. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So Barnabas, we see in verse 24 how how the Lord is at liberty in the way He arranges those verses. And through the study of the Scriptures, we see that it's first faith. And then the grace that attends that faith. And then the Holy Ghost that comes in and ministers the Word of Truth and, and, and the Spirit of truth fills us and then we can be a good man. And when we can, what's one of the benefits? Verse 24, much people was added to the Lord. You know, it'll be very hard to go out and be an evangelist for Jesus Christ and lead anyone to the Lord Jesus Christ if you yourself personally are not full of faith in the Holy Ghost. One of the reasons is because you truly will not be a good man. Remember that talk, hypocrites in the church? There's hypocrites out of the church too. Christian hypocrites. And don't think the world doesn't notice when you say one thing and preach one thing, like the froward man whose lips speak in one direction, but his feet take him in another. The world notices that quickly. And people won't be added to the Lord with that kind of a divided witness. But when you're full of faith and you're full of the Holy Ghost and, and, and it's Jesus' goodness leading you, then you have an answer that your adversaries cannot gainsay nor re- resist. And you will find people coming to the Lord. It's true. Not just by your lifestyle. Because a man that's uh, full of faith cannot help but speak out of the abundance of his heart, the good treasure in his heart. And he evangelizes too. And then people follow. And people hear the word. And people are converted. And so this is the way it works. Verse 25. So, so after Barnabas has been a while up there in Antioch, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now, if you remember when we studied on Saul's life up here before, that when Saul was converted in Damascus, he spent a few weeks or months there. And then by his own testimony, he went out to Arabia for about three years, where the Lord Jesus personally took him through another three-year ministry like he took his disciples through. And the Lord Jesus revealed unto him Not just the Old Testament, but the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the church epistles from Romans to Philemon under the dispensation we now live under, the dispensation of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And and then after that, Paul went to Jerusalem and they weren't too sure of him there, so he fled after a few weeks and he went to Tarsus. And he lived in the region of Tarsus for about seven years. And now Barnabas comes looking for him. So this time of ministry is somewhere in the early 40s A.D. that we're reading about. There's been a big shift in those few verses right there, kicking forward almost years, maybe a half of a decade moving forward. But Barnabas goes to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Remember, in the multitude of counselors, then the purposes are established. The importance of assembling together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Jesus Christ told those disciples, He said, I will build my church. So where is Jesus Christ at work in the world today? In the church in the building of His church. He knows the ministry God has given to Him. Jesus Christ is not in the world building governments. He's not building nations. He's not building hospitals. He's not building charitable works, 501c3 corporations, to to pass money around charity and all that kind of stuff. He is building the church. That's what He said. 
That's what he's doing. That's where he is. So when we are here assembled in his name, two or three gathered in his name, and the word of God's being opened, and the Father's being worshipped, Jesus is here building. What's he doing? He's building every lively stone. He's, he's structuring the edifice and edifying it and strengthening it and putting integrity in it and conforming it to his image. This is why Barnabas and Saul assembled regularly with the people because they wanted Jesus Christ in on the work. Do you want Jesus Christ in on the work? I do. I read my Bible alone and, and it's a blessing. And, and, I get, and, and the Spirit blows and it's a blessing. And I love it. And the Spirit blows. It's soft, gentle breezes as I read. But when we get in a church service and my soft, gentle breeze with his and his and his, there, there's, there's, there's something different about assembling together and the word of the Lord being opened and the worship going on. There's something different. It's just one candlestick or 40 candlesticks. There's more heat. There's more light. It's just the reality. And so they assemble together. And, and I don't like to miss the assembling. I mean, I'll be going on vacation next week. I'm going to find a place where they're assembled in the Word of the Lord Sunday. Yeah, I could have church alone with my wife. We could sit in the hotel room. I could open the Bible. I could do a little teaching with her. Look, I want to find where they're assembling in the name of the Lord, and I'm going to be there on Sunday. You can bet on it. In the midweek service, I want to be there. I want to be where the Lord is working and building, where He's got that project and the machinery is going and everybody's working and there's a lot getting done, and they assembled themselves with the church. The church is the place of assembly. It's the place where God is building His people. And I want to be there. And Paul was there. It was his uh, custom. It was his manner. Barnabas was there. And, and they assembled with the church and they taught much people. And that again, Saul, Paul, had the gift of teaching. Barnabas had the gift of teaching. Where there is an assembly, God will see to it that there is a teacher there that has a gift and woe unto that man if he doesn't exercise that gift. And that gift is to be exercised so that Jesus can work through in the assembling of His people. And they taught much people. And how the teaching is needed today. Today in Christianity there is goofy teaching going on. I, I was driving in and I heard some of the goofiest teaching. And the only thing I could think of was, was taking a, a, a bowl in the kitchen and breaking some eggs and putting it in there. And I thought, now this, these eggs represent the newborn Christian in his brain. And then taking a scrambler and scrambling their brains. And that was the kind of teaching I heard this morning. And it was very sad and grievous to hear as a teacher. As they're telling Israel is the church, the church is Israel, we're now in the tribulation, the church age is over. I mean, it was just utter confusion. Utter confusion. I, I just, I, I'm amazed at some of the things I hear in Christianity. There's one major church that preaches we're in the millennium. And we've been in it for a long time. And there's another church on church, it's a radio ministry, that preaches we're in the tribulation and there is no church and no millennium. I mean, it's as out of balance as you can get. All millennium, no trib, all trib, no millennium. And what needs is good teaching to rightly divide the word of truth and say, you know what we're in? We're in the church age right now. This is the church age. How do I know? This is a church. How do I know? I haven't been raptured. When I get raptured, the church age is over. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Revelation 4, verse 1. Okay? Then the church age is over. Then what happens? Well, we kick into Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, then begins the tribulation. How long does it go? Seven years. Revelation 19, it's over. Then what happens? Jesus Christ comes back. Sets up a thousand year kingdom on this earth. Good teaching. Where does it go on? In the church. You're not going to get this in Time Magazine. You're not going to get this in the newspaper. The Discovery Channel is not going to teach you this stuff. Where are you going to get these things? In the church. Where Paul, Barnabas, people like that are teaching, assembling together. The pillar and ground of truth. Here's where you're going to get it. And what happens? And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. This is the first time you'll see the name Christian in your Bible. Christians. The people in, in the city of Antioch, the other couple hundreds of thousands that weren't saved, were watching this group get together and assemble themselves on a regular basis and to come out with the grace of God 
and to live a life that was completely different from the unsaved people as they got away from the pagan festivals and they stopped drinking alcoholic beverages and, and they stopped uh, uh, getting involved in gambling. And, and all of a sudden they were living quiet and peaceable and honest lives. And at the same time they were concerned for their neighbors and their family and they were giving them truth and telling them about this one Jesus that was resurrected from the dead that could give them eternal life too. And they said this is, this is an interesting group. And they're always talking about this Christ. They're always talking about this Christ. We'll call them Christians. And then I wonder, how many people would call you a Christian at work? How many people will call you a Christian in your neighborhood? One of the ways that they might is if you always talk about Jesus Christ. Because the people in Antioch heard these Christians talking about Jesus Christ all the time. So they, they associated the people with the man, Christ Jesus. Hmm, always talking about this man. People, people were called Trotskyites because they followed the teachings of Trotsky, who was a communist. People were called Marxists because they read Marx. I remember what Ronald Reagan said about that. He's talking one day about a, uh, someone was asking him, do you know what a communist is or, or why are you not a communist? He says, I'll tell you this. A communist is a man that reads Karl Marx. And someone like me and people that aren't communists are people that read Karl Marx and understand him. <laughs> and we're not communists. Well, well, look, people get certain monikers attached to them based on what they do and who they follow and the name they lift up. These people were lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And they were identified as Christians. It was the local people in Antioch saying, those are Christians. And that happened to Grecians, to Greeks, to Gentiles, not Jews. And there was probably some Jews with that church in that region of Antioch. Now, they're first called Christians in Antioch. Now, this is almost very smallly, uh, sublimely put in Old Testament prophecy, but it'd be easy to read right over it. Let me show you a few verses. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 65. In my readings, I stumble over these verses sometimes and I mark them. Isaiah chapter 65. They were called Jews. That was God's work in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the work is going to be in Christ and they'll be called Christians. And in Isaiah 65, in this particular chapter, the Lord says in verse 1, I am, in all caps in your King James Bible, I love that, because that's Jesus speaking, the great I am. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me. Behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. God's already starting to point to the fact that he's going to move out beyond, in another testament, beyond the Jews. See, because I've spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people, that's the Jews, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, that's the Jews. And by the way, uh, you better watch it. That can be a Christian today. There can be spiritual application to a Christian. There are a lot of rebellious Christians today that, don't, that walk in the way that's not good. There are a lot of rebellious Christians that walk after their own thoughts. I had a vision from an angel. That's your own wicked thoughts that you had a vision from an angel. Because the Bible tells you plainly in the New Testament, God does not use His holy angels to speak to His people. The only thing He uses to speak to His people is His Word. And his spirit will guide him into the word. But today Christianity's gotten just as goofy. But at this time, it was the Jews that were getting walking away. Verse 3, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, sacrificing gardens and burn incense upon altars of brick. Today there are Christian churches that burn incense and have groves. Same type of things are repeated. And, and, then, and then what he finally says in the 15th verse, he says, ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen uh, for the Lord shall slay these, talking to the Jews, and call his servants by another name. Just, just sublimely put in there that there's a day coming when God was going to change the name of his servants to something else. They were known as Jews in the Old Testament. He's going to call them by another name. Christians in Antioch. That's the name. Let me show you. I'll show you more. Go to Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17. And, and this occurred in Antioch, which was the queen city of the region of Syria. Syria. Watch this. 
in verse 3, Isaiah 17, 3. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, that's in, in Israel, and the kingdom from Damascus, watch, and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Antioch, Syria. God's almost marking it out in the Old Testament. Let's see another place where Moses marks it out in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Little sublime things just hidden in the Scriptures. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's the honor of kings and teachers to search these things out and then reveal it to the church. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26. Looking here at, uh, at verse 1. He's talking to the uh, nation Israel as they're coming into the land, the Jews. He says, uh, And it shall be when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, Verse 3, thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days. Uh, verse 5, and thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. Now, now he's talking, what he's talking about is he's saying, look, if you think very carefully, Jewish person, talking to the Jews, Moses, if you think very carefully about your heritage, it traces back to who did God name Israel? Jacob. And Jacob was a Syrian up there with Laban, ready to perish. Laban was going to kill him. And it was from that I birthed this nation in the Old Testament. And, and be careful, because when it's time for me to, to birth the new uh, servant with the new name in the New Testament, don't be surprised if I do the same work and repeat it in Syria. Just keep your eyes open. That's what he's warning the Jews for. And so I just wanted to show those verses to you. They're first called Christians in Antioch. That's in Syria. Now, now the reason that's kind of important is because we live in a day right now where there's so much confusion in Christianity that there are, there are different Bibles. You can go to a bookstore and ask for a Bible and they'll say, which version do you want? Now, the truth is, there aren't really different Bibles. There's only one Bible. And all the other versions are perversions of the Bible. And if you study the history carefully, you will find that the first writings of the New Testament were centered around Antioch. And I'm reading here, uh, Dr. Ruckman did some of the history of this. And... Uh, the home base of Paul's missionary journeys and activities will be Antioch. He'll be going out from Antioch. And it's from this city where Paul did his work went forth the first translations of the New Testament. The original work that God did in the New Testament was right there where he had the new servant by a new name, Christians, in Syria. And it's the Antioch group of texts. If you do manuscript evidence, and my brother here has done them, you'll trace them back to Antioch. And there's a group of Greek texts that come right back to Antioch. There's also another group of Greek texts that come from Alexandria. And that's in uh, Africa near Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt. And of course, you're not to go to Egypt. And those Alexandrian Greek texts are the ones where all the perversions come from. This is a, the classic example of one, is the New World translation of the Scriptures that the Jehovah's Witnesses use. This is an English rendering taken from those Greek Alexandrian manuscripts. But the Bible you have, the King James, is the only one taken from the Greek manuscripts found in Antioch, right here. And that's the, that's the English Bible that God has chosen. It's called the Textus Receptus, the imperial text, the receive text. They are found in Syrian manuscripts between 100 to 300 A.D. Then Paul took these, his friends took them eastward. They went into Persia eventually. These are the manuscripts where them were altered in Alexandria and altered in Rome by Jerome uh, in 450 A.D., altered in Alexandria by Origen in 240 A.D., altered by others. And now these other manuscripts through the Dark Ages came forward, gave the Latin Roman Catholic Vulgate Bible, gave the other Greek manuscripts that give you the New World Translation, the NIV, the NASB, the, the quote New King James Bible. There is no New King James Bible. 
How can there be? Is there a new King James sitting on the throne? There's a queen on the throne. It's the Queen Elizabeth Bible. I mean, it can't possibly be a new King James Bible. That's what's sitting on the throne right now. Now, if there was a new King James on the throne, it might be a new King James Bible, but there isn't. And God won't allow another King James to sit on the throne. There's only one King James Bible taken from the Textus Receptus, taken from the texts that were received right there in Antioch where they were first called Christians. Now, continuing, and we'll finish this chapter very quickly, just four short verses. Acts chapter 11. In these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. By the way, the first reference of Antioch was in chapter 6 when the faithful men were called, and it was found in the faithful men in verse 5. And the second reference is right here in the 11th chapter where God now is taking the gospel to the Greeks, to the non-speaking people. God is establishing it in your Bible for you. So, there came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them, a man named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt at Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. In other words, when the church in Antioch knew there was going to be great problems and dearth throughout the world, especially the Roman world and the world of the Jews in Judea, and there would be needs there, they took a collection up to help their Jewish brethren back in Jerusalem and in Judea. And, and God wants us to remember the poor and to minister to the household of faith and to minister to Jews that know the Lord Jesus Christ and minister to Gentiles that know the Lord Jesus Christ where there are places of need. This is how he works in his church. Now, it's interesting uh, this happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So again, these little historical uh, references are put in the Bible where you can test it out. Claudius Caesar reigned from 41 A.D. to 54 A.D. Now, there were other rulers, local rulers, by the name of Claudius. It was a, it was a popular name. But by putting the name Claudius Caesar there, you're able to fix the timeline as to when this occurred. There were people named Claudius that ruled in the 60s and 70s. And, but it was Claudius Caesar between 41 and 54 A.D. And the famine occurred between 44 and 48 A.D. So this prophet came at least a year before the famine, maybe two years before the famine, and prophesied according to the Holy Spirit at a time when there still were prophets. Because there were still prophets until the canon of the scripture was closed. And then after 96 AD, there are no more prophets. Apostles and prophets were the foundational ministries of the church. All there are today are evangelists, pastors and teachers. No apostles, no prophets. But it's curious. It's in the days of Claudius Caesar. That's removed from the Alexandrian manuscripts. Because the Alexandrian manuscripts went to Rome and became the Roman manuscripts of the Roman Catholic Church. And that put a bad light on one of the Roman rulers. So it's just Claudius. So here in the New World Translation, the name Caesar is missing. And I take that personally. No, no, I'm just, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I just The thing is, it, it takes away the historical reference. It ruins the historical references that God fixes in his scriptures. All right, so we finish that 11th chapter, and we see that God now is moving the gospel forward to the Gentile, the Greek-speaking world. And thankfully, we're going to see the gospel go to the uttermost parts of the earth as these missionary journeys will begin in Antioch and go forth. But remember, personally, we need to do like Barnabas exhorted. We need to, to purpose in our heart that we would cleave to the Lord, that we would increase our faith, that we would assemble with the church, that we would allow the Holy Ghost to fill us and we could be good men and many people could be added unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, teaching in the 11th chapter. And, uh, and I pray you'll help us as we go forth each and every word covering the precious words you've given to us. Thank you for the scriptures. And thank you that those scriptures point to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we live and speak in a way that people would call us Christians. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.